continuing with our big project here. The Harmony of the Gospels, part 21 now. Part 21. We left off uh, part 20 in the middle of these uh, parables of the kingdom. Yeah, there's quite a few right in a row. So I want to remind everybody, and we're, we talk about the parables, Parables can teach us an awful lot. That's why we have them. But they can also be vague. So you can't build doctrine on parables. You can expound on doctrine using parables. You cannot create doctrine solely on a parable. We got to keep this in mind when we're going through this today because we're going to be finishing up with several parables still. And we're going to hopefully discuss some of the stuff that's in there. Okay. We last uh, finished the parable of the, the sower sowing seeds. Right. And this is another one referring to the last part of that particular parable, if you remember, where the seed fell on good ground. This one is in Matthew 13 and verse 24. <clears throat> and he put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is compared to a man who is sowing good seed in his field. This is the good field. This is a good field because it's his field. And we know that the man sowing the seed is God, Jesus Christ. And the seed is the Spirit. Okay? So we know this is, a, this is the good field. This is not rocky, not, not rocky ground. It's not thorny places. It's not by the wayside. It's in a good field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. Now when the blades sprouted up and produced fruit, then the tares also appeared. Now let's examine that a little bit more. For starters, what is a tear? Wheat? No, it's not wheat. It looks a lot like wheat. I said weed. Weed! Okay. <laughs> Speak up a little bit. Yes, it is weed. <laughs> like your marijuana? Yeah. <laughs> it's a weed, man. <laughs> it's a weed, yes. Yeah. It is a weed, correct, yes. Uh, there are several types of weeds. In this field, um, being among the wheat, it's a weed that looks like wheat. And the one that looks like wheat is called a darnel grows up in wheat fields. It's all around the world too. Okay. And it's useless. It takes up space, it chokes off the, the wheat that's there. <clears throat> and in its early stages of growth, it looks very much like wheat. It's not until the fruit starts to come in the wheat that you can determine the difference. Wheat has a brown color when it starts to ripen, and the darnel is the black color. Right? There's also differences in the, in the stems, and if you really know agriculture, then you can look at it before the fruit comes, and you can, you can determine it. But it takes a close eye to see it, a very close eye to see it. But when the fruits start to come, it's obvious. It's very obvious. And this is being compared to the kingdom and the sower sowing seed in his land, in his ground, in his fertile soil, right? And there was only good seed that was sown there, only good seed, and yet tares are growing among it. In the Roman times, you know, Roman law actually prohibited uh, the sowing of this darnel among the wheat in an enemy's field. Right? 
don't have time to go into why, but you know, if they're going to over, I'm just going to postulate because I didn't have time to dig into this part, but you know, if they're going to overcome them, take over their land, and they're going to start producing agriculture there, they would, I would imagine they would want to have good soil with Is that a reasonable postulation there? But anyway, Roman law prohibited so the sowing of Darnell among the wheat of an enemy. Also, um, if you ate the fruit of this weed, Darnell, it would cause a sick, drunken nausea. You wouldn't feel good at all. And it could also be fatal. So it's pretty interesting that this particular weed is put in a parable about the kingdom. So verse 27. And the servants came to the master of the house and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Then where did these tares come from? Of course, because if you sowed wheat, you expect wheat. You don't expect tares. <clears throat> and the servants were perplexed by that. Right? Let's say that the field is the church. Right? And among the church, you see tares. That can be confusing, if you think about it, because God calls. God's the only one who calls, right? And God draws. And you can only be a Christian if God calls. And your heart is right, right? That's the fertile ground. The soil is your heart ready to take that seed, the Spirit of God. So where does the tares come from? And he said to them, in verse 28, A man who is an enemy has done this. And the servant said to him, Do you want us to go out and gather them? So pause here again. A man who is an enemy has done this. We would surmise that that's Satan doing that, wouldn't you? But is Satan sowing a different seed among the church and it growing up among? Or is something else happening? Now again, these are parables. You can't make doctrine out of anything, right? But trying to make sense out of reality, right? And comparing it to another reality, which is the kingdom of God, is what we're trying to do when we go through the parables. If you want to study the parables in, in some detail and try to make greater sense out of them, right? So how does this happen? Remember the parable of, about the sower you know, sowing seed, good seed, on the good ground. So what's a reasonable thing that you can, ex you can maybe surmise out of this or postulate out of this? Because the seed is always good. The seed that's being sown is you know, the Spirit, God, being received in a good and right heart, the ground, and it starts developing and becoming spiritually mature, right? That's what we normally see, right? That's what, that's what we, we know as believers. That's how, the, that's how you become part of the family of God, right? So the ground in which it is sown, the heart of a person, can initially be very receptive, right? At the good ground. And what happens when you become a Christian? You still have your, you still live in this world, you still have your life before. Yes, you do. There could be things in there that are <coughs> holding you back, or there could be family members that are putting things in your head, or people you know around you. Yeah. I consider that all weeds, per se, in a good field. Yeah. That's what I've always understood. That could be, yeah, that's, 
Remember the, the, the parable before yeah. that other parable, the, the, the third place where the, the thorns grew up and choked. Well, yeah, because it was thrown in, in, in uh, thorny yeah. ground. Not, not good soil, but thorny soil. Yeah. That's that. But this is the parable about the good soil. It's different. It's a little bit different. Okay. The hint is here, um, well, man, well, but while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. What is Satan trying to do with God's people? Destroy them. He's trying to destroy them, yes. And how does he do that? Can you second guess what you think? Remember, we're going to, yeah, that is very right, it's very good. He's also trying to explain the false doctrine. Yeah. I want to be more specific with, with, with the way the parables are, are, are going here, yes. The heart is the fertile ground, right? And if your heart is right, like we talked about last time, if your heart is ready, if the ground is fertile, if the soil is good soil, then the seed, the spirit, can come in and change that heart, and you can spiritually grow. Satan is trying to sow another seed in that heart, in that good ground that's there, in your spiritual immaturity. Satan is constantly trying to sow another seed, the spirit of rebellion, the spirit of bitterness, Right? And a tear can take root in that good ground, your heart, alongside the wheat that's growing there, the Spirit of God. Right? And someone who previously was a believer can turn away. Remember, I'm not making doctrine from a parable. But you have to try to make sense of it, right? And Jesus Christ himself talks about stuff coming up, right? But not to the depth that I'm describing it at the moment, or trying to. Now, does that, does that make sense to you based on what we know about how God works how Satan works with God's people. When you're talking about the good ground, the fertile ground. To me that does. To me that does. So the lesson here is you need to guard your heart always and make sure that a different seed tear, for instance, does not start taking root in your heart, in your fertile ground, which is your heart, and start growing up alongside the spirit in you and overcoming it. Because you can quench the spirit, can you not? How does that happen? Does that happen overnight? No, it doesn't. It takes a long time to do that. And it starts with a spirit of rebellion, a spirit of bitterness. And it develops and it grows. Right? When a root starts shooting up, it's a tiny little thing. But you give it water, you give it sun, you, you, you feed it. Right? It starts maturing. And if you've got the spirit of rebellion and bitterness maturing in your heart, it will choke off the wheat that is there. Verse 28, and he said to them, a man who is an enemy has done this. Then the servant said to him, do you want us to go out and gather them? But he said, no, lest while you were gathering the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. <clears throat> okay. now based, based on what I was talking here about, Does it not make sense that 
You can't just go into a person's heart. No, no one can, other than you, yourself, right? And change that heart. You can't just uproot the tear. Nobody else can just uproot the tear, right? Nobody else can do that. You can. Yourself. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather the tares first and bind them into bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my granary. You have your human physical life to live. And you have time to struggle with this world. And you have time to fight against the wiles of this world, the spirits of this world that are against God. And both can be growing together in your heart. And how would you separate them to begin with? I mean, you can't. You can't. It's impossible. I mean, you can't take away one without the other. I mean, I mean, someone else that is, you know? You have to, yourself, choke off any tear that may be uprooting or, or coming to grow in your own heart. You have to do it. You can have help from your brethren, of course. You have to do that. But if the tears grow enough in your heart and overcome the wheat, then when the angels, the reapers come, they will separate the tares from the wheat at that time. <clears throat> Does anyone have a comment on any of that? And I just want to cross-reference that with Matthew 3. I covered that a long time ago. <clears throat> Matthew 3, verse 11. It says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I, of whom I am not fit to carry his sandals. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire whose winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn up with unquenchable fire. At the time of the harvest, there will be a separation of the chaff and the wheat, and the chaff will be gathered and burned. At the time of the harvest, not in the middle of your life, your physical life, at the harvest, at the end, at your judgment. Are there tares in the church, physical human beings, right, that are tares that have, you know, overcome, the tares have already overcome the wheat, and they're among us, and their fruits are showing, and they're black? You can postulate that that is a, a correct statement. What do you do about that? That's a very, very interesting subject. I mean, obviously, if there's problems in, in a church, and there's somebody who's obviously in this mind, who has a rebellious nature, you have to deal with them, don't you? Right? Look at what happened in Corinthians. That man was to be cast out, right? <clears throat> that man repented, though. That man had a chance, even though his t the tares were overcoming and choking the wheat in his heart. When he was cast out of the church, right? it was for the purpose of Satan to destroy the body so that the soul can be saved, right? In other words, if he just went along, merrily along, in the church group, and the church group just kept him right along like that in a merry way, then he, he wouldn't have changed anything. He wouldn't have been forced to come to a shocking realization that something's wrong. I need to examine my heart. 
I need to overcome these terrors, uproot them myself, pluck them out of my heart. And he did. He came to a humbling state. Yes, he did. Right? He abhorred himself. He became ashamed, didn't he? And he uprooted those tears in his own heart. And the church accepted him back, didn't they? And Paul said that, that yes, what this man went through was enough. Welcome him back. Right? Fortunately, it did not go to the end where the angels had to separate him at the, at the harvest and cast him into the fire. <clears throat> Any comments on that? Okay. Let's turn over to Mark 4 for a moment. Mark 4, verse 26. Then he said, The kingdom of God is likened to this. It is as if a man should cast seed upon the earth, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed should sprout and grow. But he does not know how. For the earth brings forth fruit of itself, first a blade, then a head, then full grain in his head. <clears throat> the Spirit of God enters into your heart into your into your being into your mind it right? changes you into the good soil right and it takes time for spiritual maturity to come to pass it takes time and we don't understand how it all happens how the whole process goes just like we don't understand how a seed goes into the ground and sprouts up into this little little bud and grows over time we just recognize the different stages of it as, as it is. Notice verse 29. And when the grain is mature, immediately he puts it to the sickle, for the harvest has come. In other words, that person is ready for the kingdom. They've made it. <clears throat> when spiritual maturity has come, come it is ready for harvest does that mean it's time to die no no but if you did right there's no worries the safest place for a Christian is in the ground it's a done deal the next waking moment you're you're there you're it When a Christian who is young and seems to be good in all, all ways, good all, in all aspects, right? I'm just going to pick this young, right? Maybe either 20s or 30s or maybe they're a father or a mother with young children and something tragic happens to them. They're a Christian and something tragic happens to them. Some Christians are thrown by that. They don't understand why. Why would God not have healed them? Why would God not have given them a longer time to help their families mature and see grandchildren? Why were they taken by that car accident or whatever it might have been? And sometimes that's a stumbling block for some Christians. And Satan can use that <clears throat> as a potential tear in their heart to grow a root of bitterness. All right? That's what happens sometimes. 
God was not responsible for that person's death. No. Could God have saved them? Healed them? Prevented that accident? Sure. But for whatever reason, that wasn't God's will. And God knows that that person is, is, has made it. And that is the greater good, isn't it? Because that's, the work is accomplished in that person. It's a finished work. It's a done deal. And it's a happy thing for Christians, even though they're going to miss them, and it's a tragic thing in, for their physical lives and family, they've made it. They've made it. When the grain is mature, immediately he puts it to, this, to the sickle, for the harvest has come. For whatever time it happens to be for that person's life. A lot of Christians are dismayed when something tragic happens to a loved one. And it can cause a root of bitterness in their heart. And they can blame God. I prayed day and night for weeks, months, years. Why didn't you listen to me? Right? And it can change your heart and turn you from God. Do you know God's purpose better than he does? Nobody knows God's purpose better than he does. If a Christian happens to die before his or her natural life, right? They've made it. And it's okay. And we can be comforted by that. As tragic as it is for us who remain behind and who mourn that person, but can rejoice because we know we will see them soon. So don't let something like that, if something like that happens in your life, don't let it change you. Be thankful to God because that person has made it. Okay. Back to Matthew 13. Verse 31. Another parable he presented to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is compared to a tiny mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is very small among all the seeds, but after it has grown, it is a greater than all the herbs, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of heaven come and roost in its branches. Over to Mark 4, verse 30. <clears throat> and he said... To what then shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we compare it? It is like a tiny mustard seed, which when it has been sown upon the earth, is less than all the seeds that are upon the earth. Less than all the seeds that are upon the earth. But after it has been sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs, and produces great branches, so that the birds of heaven are able to roost under the shadow of it. God can accomplish the greatest work out of the very least of things. God is not limited. The very least of things can become the very greatest things. And if you ever wonder about yourself, your own worthiness, or whatever, based on whatever your life used to be, trust in God that he can change you into something great. And don't judge others who you may know have some intimate knowledge of their life because the same is true of them. You have no idea 
how God is working in their life personally, other than the fruit that you see them display. But you don't know them intimately the same way God knows them. <clears throat> so be careful in that regard. God can take the very least and make it the greatest of all. Matthew 13, verse 33. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is compared to leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until all was leavened. That's an interesting one. It's interesting because leaven is used to compare <coughs> the kingdom. And we also, we also know that it's used to you know, compare and describe sin, don't we? A tiny mustard seed, the least of all seeds, or a bit of leaven. I mean, we're interesting comparisons here. A bit of leaven sown into a good heart, or let's, let's use leaven as the spirit, right? A tiny bit of God's spirit sown into a good heart can grow and spread as long as the heart remains good into a glorious work of God until the entire being is consumed with the Spirit of God. Or, a small bit of leaven, sin, can grow in that same heart, like a, a tear, or many tears for instance, and it is changing that heart, allow even more, allowing even more sin to enter until the whole heart is now corrupted by it and the tares have overwhelmed it. Because leaven just works, it just, just spreads and it just keeps on going until it's consumed it. In a good way, the spirit dominates or rebellion dominates. <clears throat> Verse 34, Jesus spoke all these things to the multitudes in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them. Very interesting. So that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, and will utter things hidden from the foundation of the world. I will utter things hidden from the foundation of the world of the world. I will tell them in parables. I will keep it hidden purposely. When he talked to the multitudes, it was always in parables. And what did he fulfill? What was that? Um, Psalm 78. I just want to read that. You don't have to turn there. It's just one verse. I think. Psalm 78, verse 2. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will speak dark sayings of old. <clears throat> what did people come to see Jesus for in great multitudes? I've asked this question many <clears throat> times already. Probably more his works than anything. Yes, they came to see a show or hopefully be healed. Would you go and see a speaker speak when you couldn't understand anything that speaker was saying? It was totally confusing. Why would you travel a long way? Great multitudes, vast multitudes. Why? if they wouldn't understand it. Why? Why would you spend the time unless there was something else to see? 
the people at large didn't understand Jesus at all. They understood something great was happening, but they didn't know what. They knew they were going to hear him speak. They also probably knew they weren't going to understand what he was talking about. But, just wait till he starts doing something. That's when the real magic will come. Shouldn't use the word magic, right? <laughs> it's not. It's not at all. The power that Jesus Christ displayed was the power coming from God through him. And that would have been something to see, wouldn't it? Seeing the dead raised, the, the deaf hear, the, the blind see, the lame walk. That would have been a show. And that would happen today too. Vast multitudes would come to see that. They'd even pay money to see it. Yes, they would. They'd pay lots of money actually to see that. Not necessarily to have anything done for themselves, but just to be a witness of it and, and, and like, wow, he really can do that. That's amazing. I wonder how he's doing it. There was also a lot of good people, though, that displayed a lot of great faith. And Jesus recognized those specific individuals. And he taught about that. He says, look, I have not found such faith in all of Judea as this. Let it be done to you as your faith has shown. Right? Those were good examples. Those were, those were people that really deserved the miracle. But Christ had compassion on multitudes. And he healed multitudes. He didn't just heal the ones that showed and displayed great faith. He had great compassion on the people. But he knew that they wouldn't understand yet. And they wouldn't understand yet because they were still, in their heart, a rebellious people. Their heart wasn't ready yet. But through his ministry, he was working to change their hearts. John the Baptist led the way before him with the mantra, Repent! Change your heart, for the kingdom is near. Change your heart. Be baptized and change your heart. This had to be said over and over and over and over again. And it takes something like that to change someone's heart. To make it a good soil, a good fertile ground. Because the Spirit of God is not going to enter into somebody's heart unless the ground, the soil, the heart is ready for it. And you will not understand the parables of Jesus until the soil is right and rich for you to do so. And it wasn't to a large extent for these people. Not that they were bad people, but they weren't ready yet. Christ said, look at the harvest, look, look at the field. It's ripe, it's right. We just need workers to go out there and change these people's hearts and draw them to God. Mark 4, verse 33. <clears throat> and with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear. For without a parable, he did not speak to them. He didn't speak to them plainly at all. For without a parable, he did not speak to them. But he explained all things to his disciples privately. Privately. Their heart was ready. They needed this knowledge. He was preparing them 
to take on his ministry, that what he was doing now before them, he was preparing them to take over that when he went to the Father. He explained all things that they needed privately, in detail. Things that we don't have written here. <clears throat> but to the people, no. And that's because it takes time. The message has to sink in. How long did it take you hearing the Word of God before your heart started to change and became that fertile ground for the Spirit to be received? How long did that take? How long does it take anybody else? Only they and God know. Because the Father knows when the soil is ready to receive His Spirit and to be worked with. Some, it's in the first, first um, spring harvest. For the vast majority, it's the fall harvest. <clears throat> That's just the way it is. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a perfect plan. It's a merciful plan. It's a plan that will bear the most fruit, actually. There isn't a plan that's better than that to produce more fruit. If you can think of a one, take it up with God. I don't think, I don't think you're going to be able to figure that one out, though. It's a perfect plan to produce the most fruit. Unfortunately, there's going to be some chafe that will get burned. And that's unavoidable. Back to Matthew 13. <clears throat> Verse 36. And after dismissing the multitude, Jesus went into the house. <clears throat> Then his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said to them, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. And the field is the world, and the good seed, these are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Okay? I mean, the field is the world. People. Right? Not the, not the ground. People. Human beings. Right? And the good seed, these are the children of the kingdom. Right? The good seed, the spirit going into these children that have their hearts right. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Jesus doesn't explain that in too much detail. That's why I went into a bit more detail previously to try to understand that a little better. Again, I'll say it again. Parables are not to be made doctrines of them. They are to be used to help you understand established doctrine that's already in place. Now the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and consumed in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this age. <clears throat> the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all of the offenders and those who are practicing lawlessness, and they shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> These are those who had the knowledge of God revealed to them, and they allowed tares to grow in their heart and quench the spirit that was there. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, the one who has ears to hear, let him hear. <clears throat> Again, the kingdom of heaven is compared to treasure hid in a field, 
which when a man finds, he conceals, and for the joy of finding it, goes and sells everything that he has and buys that field. That's self-explanatory. Once you find the kingdom, right? once you find the way to the kingdom, and you have that heart that is ready for it, nothing else really matters. You know? You don't literally go and sell everything, but it's figurative. Nothing else in your life is as important. You still have to live. You still have to support yourself and your family. You still have to work. You still have to interact with people. You still have to do all these things, but they're secondary in your life. They're not a primary focus anymore. Again, the kingdom of heaven is compared to a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who after finding one very precious pearl went and sold everything that he had and bought it. Yes. <clears throat> Have you ever heard of religions that once you've come to their belief, tell you to sell everything and give it to them and they will provide for you? Have you ever heard about that? Oh yeah, that's out there. You know, they use stuff like this to condone that. People twisting scriptures. Again, the kingdom of heaven is compared to a dragnet cast into the sea, gathering in every kind of fish, which after it was filled was drawn up on shore, and they sat down and collected the good into vessels, and the unfit they threw away. This is the way it will be in the end of the age. The angel shall go out and shall separate the wicked from the righteous and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That will happen to an unfortunate few. Hopefully it's only few. Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like a man who is a householder who brings forth out of his treasure things new and old. In other words, every teacher <clears throat> of the Word of God, or anybody who teaches or, or, or talks about the Word of God to anybody else who's, who's been instructed and has somewhat mastered this, brings out of the storehouse, you know, out of the Bible, both old teachings, Old Testament, Nothing's gone away from there. And new, new teachings. Jesus Christ came and astonished people with the spiritual teachings that he, that he gave. 2 Timothy. just want to read that. Because some people think the Old Testament doesn't have any value anymore. And Christ said, no, 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 no. It brings forth out of his treasure things new and old. And Paul says that to Timothy too. In chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue in the things that you did learn and were assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from a child... You have known the holy writings, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith. The writings don't make you wise to salvation alone, but through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for conviction, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. This whole book 
is still relevant today as it was yesterday. And finally, Matthew 13, verse 53. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. And that will conclude part 21.